the Virtual World Society. Join us in building better realities together. So welcome everybody. I'm really excited about today. Um, Thank you, Tom, for hosting this as always, and Christopher for joining us special today. But thank you for the great turnout here in Engage. And this marks our first event in Engage after the tragic news about Altspace. Um, we had a really nice setup in Altspace with a world that Tom had, had commissioned and we had a nice community over there. But uh, nothing lasts forever, so it seems. Um, and here we find ourselves in Engage. And this is our first fireside chat in Engage. And um, just want to give a big shout out to educators in VR who's supporting this event. Um, Laurel and Lance and the team are here to help you. If you have any uh, problems, you will likely be managed by uh, one of them discreetly. Uh, you will be on mute during the main part of the talk. Um, you are able to unmute yourself, but we ask that for audio quality uh, and the quality of experience that you remain muted. If you do need attention, you can wave your hand or you can approach Laurel on the side here. Um, at the end, we will have a bit of a Q&A uh, with Chris and Tom, as we always do. And then we will uh, be managing your mics or allow you to um, unmute yourself and then contribute in that way as well. Um, I think that's all from me, just to say I'm really, really excited. This is a great turnout. If you're wondering where we are, this uh, photosphere here is Lake Geneva. Um, I found it on Google Maps, and because it's VR, you can do that. You can bring it in. Beautiful space. And... Um, this set at the front here is our first iteration of a stage for Tom and his fireside guests. Without further ado, um, Chris, are you ready? Yes, sir, I am. Fantastic. <laughs> Let me make sure that your mic is full on. It is. Uh, how about Tom? Tom, are you Testing. ready? I'm ready. Testing. Ready to rock Fantastic. and roll. Well, I'm going to get out of your way and enjoy this. Over to you, Tom and Chris. Take it away. Okay. Thanks so much, Daniel, and thanks, Laurel. Uh, this is a temporary space for us. We hopefully will be able to import uh, our Victorian mansion library uh, or something like to it into this world because it was so cozy. And, uh, and uh, the fire was, uh, was behind us. Uh, Chris, today the fire is in front of us, you know. So that, uh, that may be uh, some, there's maybe a message in that. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, but... Uh, <laughs> Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be to see you in this new space and especially to be together again with my great friend uh, Christopher Lafayette. Uh, Chris, this is the third appearance that you've made on, uh, on our fireside chats uh, uh, and um, uh, the last one was actually in July. And um, but um, you know uh, uh, those of you who uh, are sure you know about Chris, uh, he has been on quite a journey this past year. Uh, I remember when he started thinking and telling us about his vision of the Gatherverse. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of, lot of patter going on about the Metaverse and what's going to happen and things like that. And Chris had a different angle about this, and this idea of, the, of gathering to where we gather and, and not just the, the gearheads, not just the guys that are, are the techos. But everyone that could make use of this technology, and um, and so he thought, let's gather and let's discuss these things and look at it from different perspectives, and um, and that was a vision he he shared with us, and we thought, oh, okay, that's interesting, and of course, what he what happened was a year ago, uh, uh, he held the first Gatherverse Summit which was dedicated toward humanitarian uh, uh, applications of what we can do with this, this technology. Now, Chris, I'm, I'm going to start asking you some questions about um, uh, what has happened since that time. So here you were uh, at the first, uh, first gather first came up, and then, of course, that started something. Why don't you tell us what it started? Well, first of all, start with your, your vision, what you, what you thought would happen versus what happened. Sure, of course, I'm happy to. And I'd be remiss in not expressing thanks for 
those that helped put this together and help produce this event. Um, it's quite a uh, really an honor to sit here with you, Tom, and I really appreciate every opportunity that I'm afforded to be able to share some time with you and everyone else that came out to share with us. And looking back retroactively and thinking in consideration of year zero when it comes to uh, gatherverse.org, we, you know, I sat and I remember in the late season of autumn of 21, and I have for some time, literally for years, felt like that I wanted to build a platform that really spoke to the humanity first approach or really uh, the impact of technology on human relationships and wondering for what and for whom have we been building all the techno all the, the technology that we have been developing and ideating and from hardware to software for and for those of us that have been in the XR space in the immersive community, um, certainly probably all of us, not anywhere nearly compared to how long <laughs> you've been in here, Tom. But when I looked at the ideas of extended reality, you know, so we'll call XR for acronym, and thinking and considering have said on many stages by then that if we're going to extend reality, then we must bring reality with it and not looking at this avid launch of this metaverse or the conceptual metaverse if you will coined by neil stevenson and not necessarily having a colloquial front on what is the metaverse and definition and scope beyond novels because it's subjected to interpretation is it roddenberry's metaverse the holodeck is it ernest klein's ready player one's uh, ontolo ontological anthropocentric simulation immersive system so when we talk about the metaverse <laughs> What are we really talking about? And so I thought about it for some time, and I remember that Tony Parisi uh, came out um, with the seven rules of the metaverse. And I agree with all of them except for one, but that's the final one that I get a little chuckle on that. But when I <laughs> saw that, I thought it was prudent and, frankly, candidly open to say, you know, what about humanity? I see nothing within that, and not to take away from Tony as a brilliant mind. And I just really felt inspired. There was nothing contrived. There was, you know, not, not a heavy strategy to enter in. And so I thought it was prudent to come out with the seven standards of the metaverse, focusing on humanity first and accessibility and education and equality, community development, safety, privacy, and wellness. And I put that out there and I saw that it was embraced by the community and started being shared in presentations and IEEE and so forth and so on. And so, I thought to take a next forward step and say, well, why don't we package an event around this called Gatherverse? You know, I get asked a lot, where did you come up with that name? And it's like, you know, it just really just came to me. And we had about, I, I thought, and I looked at the different seasons and knowing that we've become more virtual in the past 36 months than I dare say in the past 36 years, and that I realized the working world and how we go to events have been different on a hybrid level, if you will. And so I saw the opportunity to say, well, I know typically people don't hold events in person, sometimes in the winter months, um, at least here in North America. And I know there's different seasons around the world at different times. And so I said, well, why don't we have this event in February? And I talked to a few people before doing it, and I just get, went ahead and, and, and made that move. And I remember talking to Virtual World Society and, you know, and I felt really, in, in part, I have to say, Tom, with real gratitude and authenticity that, you know, when I, I served on the board for Virtual World Society, I remember meeting you and very candidly, I, I felt the takeaway that I felt was that here you have, you know, in our space, probably one of the greatest inventors that walks the face of this earth. And he's put together with all that you could do and all that you have done, but all that you could do forward and invention and the technology, you saw fit to be able to create a platform called Virtual Society, which really, in so much ways, in XR to me and from my lens and unknown from others, that's the heart um, of XR itself. And so I thought about where you decided for your next steps and your path to put your time in. And it was such a platform and 
I know have spoken with you privately on several occasions and listening to your expressions on humanity itself, I really felt imbued and felt like maybe I'm not alone at this. And so I found out that I wasn't and a couple of months that we only had to make this event, which frankly was supposed to be um, a one off event with maybe 20 speakers and 400 attendees. Well, we partnered with our good friends at AWE and uh, virtual society and linux foundation meta and hp and other platforms came together literally within about 60 days we had over 10,000 people that arrived to this event and we had speakers from around the world and i had never witnessed such a thing you know i see dr morris here you know, she participated mm -hmm. and she was with us and she comes to us from morehouse mm -hmm. um the metaversity educational system you've seen how this has flourished over the past year alone. Mm -hmm. So we've had folks from the White House that came and spoke and, and so forth and, and, and members from Virtual World Society and elsewhere. And so that really, after that event, I realized that I couldn't take my foot off the gas. And frankly, before we had the event, I realized I realized Tom was becoming a brand, right? right. And so, right. you mm -hmm. know, and, and with, with really no blueprint on how do you operate a brand for humanity at the intersection of humanity and technology? How do you operate a brand and move forward with that? Um, and know that this is what you want. You know, you listen to the audience, you listen to the community, and they'll tell you how they want to be sold. Well, we hadn't necessarily had a community. We had no really test beyond what we were able to do, but it was interesting how many people pulled up and showed up to be able to express from what they're building when it comes to the lens of humanity first approaches, from what they've been incubating, accelerating, or in market with. And so it was really inspiring to hear There's a lot of learning moments. And I realized that we've barely, if, if at all, even scratched the surface. And so we move forward through this year. So from January to now, we've had 12 events, 12 summits. <laughs> and if you would ask me last January, will we even have anything like that remotely? I would just not even consider doing something seemingly insane such as this to be able to produce this many events. But for every single event that we've had, we saw demand and people show up. And the incredible thing is, is that I feel like what we've taken away from year zero is that we've built a platform of awareness for humanity first approaches. Yet at the same time, we do it with the focus not just on the metaverse, but through emerging technologies and amplification of global expression. And really realizing that there's so many people, Tom, that are building incredible things that we don't even know that they exist because mm -hmm. of limitations and they're bound by the limitations of their market availability and presence. And I've seen people and I've met people around the world that are building incredible things in laboratories and in garages and their bedrooms and on other people's sofas and in hotels and they just, in hacker spaces and co-working spaces. And a lot of what they're building is so geared and so speaks to humanity and can benefit when it comes to sustainability. And I really wanted to create a platform where they felt like they had a voice. Now, I could have went through the highways and byways and around the trees and around the corner and looking under rocks and the nooks and crannies and looking for them, or we could create a message and a communication beacon so bright that they were drawn to the light and drawn to what we were talking about, drawn to the community, drawn to the expressions. And that's exactly what has happened. And so from there, we've really started to look at from year zero, we wanted to put together and build a brand of trust. And what we didn't want to do is build something that was already there. You know, we have, great platforms such as AWE and Laval and you know and there's so many other different event platforms that do really fine job at really expressing where we're at today and with a bit of ethnography where we've been when it comes to hardware and software development and they're fortified with folks such as yourself and and I have the pleasure of sitting on you know from advisory boards and participating with you know 400 plus other speakers that are incredible at what they do and they've done a really good job in showcasing what enterprise has been working on and the development leading up to, town, to the time now present. So there's no need to build what was already done before. But when I think about how long, in particular, immersive technologies has been in play and has been in development in the conceptual stage all the way, let's say, Figmillion Spectacles and beyond, 
all the way till now where we have folks such as yourself and those that went to NASA Ames or Department of Defense that have been building and prototyping and really going through the human trial and error of what it is to use technology and what that means and in introducing that into the global ecosystem. Now that we've gone now into this process of where it's in market, it's being adopted, you know, there's growth here, you know, people really are being educated within these systems and trained. Now I see for the next step is going from ideology stage or and uh, in, 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 in points of consideration or a contemplative narrative on what this could be to actually building it in the hardware and then software. And then the next natural progression was humanity first. And so we did it, we put it out there and found out that there was a open market available because people really connected with that. If we only had a few people attend the first event and we had some share of exchange of ideas and, and progression, and I would have felt like, you know what, good. It served its purpose and that was it, and onward to whatever else that I might find myself doing. But that certainly wasn't the case. It left a lot to be desired after the first event. And so we've continued forth on and we've had events focus on what is Web3, you know, scrutinizing what Web3 is, you know, because the world seems to think that Web3 has completely arrived and hasn't. What is Web3? You know, what does that mean from the lens of different people, transcontinental and transmetropolitan? What is um, the impact of mental wellness when it comes to um, these technologies that we build? What is happening in the African continent? What is happening in Asia continent? What is happening through South America and Central America across the three Americas with our Latin uh, communities? What's happening in the e EU continent and all the things that are happening out there? And what are some of the different obstacles that they find themselves against and barriers to their own innovation? And so we're able to really listen and listen and hear what people have to say, which is so getting out of the box. I know for me being here in Silicon Valley, as much as I enjoy living here and having been part of this community for years and have learned greatly through osmosis, I am the first one to say and to really appreciate that Silicon Valley isn't the end all stand all be all of technology. And we must hear from those around the world when it comes to cultural contribution to be able to go through a global refinement of what we're putting to market to make sure that it works, it's effective, it's serving great purpose, serving the needs of humanity, and that it's sustainable. You know, I listened to what Daniel just said earlier about Altspace. I remember hanging around those guys, Gavin Wilhine and others, and there's somatic Bruce and other incredible people that are helping build this technology here in Silicon. And I remember that they were uh, given, you know, a budget to be able to build it out, but that burned out and they ran out of their burnout and they had the sunset alt space here in Silicon Valley. So this isn't the first time that alt space was looking at a sunset. It actually went in the sunset and then Microsoft came in, picked that platform up and said, okay, we're going to acquisition this. We're going to put it back on market, go through refinements. And some of you are going to have to come up here, relocate to Bellevue and come up here and chop some wood. And so that's exactly what happened. But the thing that was it's so impactful and so impressive today is that even with a platform as strong and powerful with the much capital that Microsoft has and a powerful cloud system Azure and their sunsetting all space, it lets me know the instability of what we're looking at today across the board horizontally and technology as a whole. I have seen more people, Tom, being fired and dismissed from their positions. And these just aren't, you know, uh, people that are serving, you know, you know, you know, jobs where you're thinking, okay, who are the first to go in a company? These are positions where people are DevOps engineers, developers, 3D artists, designers, people that have brilliant minds for what we build that is relevant today in the market that are being dismissed from these platforms. I've never, I have not seen anything such as like this since before the Great Recession, and I would liken it unto the bubble. And so saying all that to say in part is that what I see happening today is the, is, has really ignited and imbued us with more of a determination to make sure that what we're building isn't just good for markets, but it's good for sustainability so that people that have made commitments for their families, that have made career decisions, have sustainability in their own homes. And what we want the metaverse to serve as a tool to help extend our reality as opposed to dismiss our reality. And so that's just really important work. And so, 
I would say in closing um, to the initial question, you know, I realize that, Tom, there's so many voices that we're familiar with in hearing in technology, in XR, uh, and beyond in emerging technologies. But I realize there's so many more, more, more of us that we don't even know and that we didn't know exist mm -hmm. and they have landed really at the doorstep of gatherers and they have shared and i've been thoroughly impressed with what it is that they're working on what it is that they're building and what it is that they've shared we had a women's summit which was the biggest mm -hmm. metaverse based xr based women's summit that's ever happened virtually and i was really happy to see um, that gatherers can help play a role a really small role in helping amplify the voices um, of how we look at not only what we're building, but who is building that. And so that's a bit more of what we're focused on for year one. And so if year zero is about amplification of global expression, then year one um, in a big way is about the focus of continental expansion. I would say human centricity, multicultural awareness, and really inspiring intercultural understanding. Wow, Chris, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, I was trying to take notes like crazy. <laughs> what you said, of course, this is going to be recorded, fortunately. We can slow you down a little bit uh, in, when, in recording and, and uh, parse out all the incredible experiences you've had. I did get a chance. I, I was uh, participated in the, in the, the first Gatherverse uh, and, uh, and several others, but that first one was like Woodstock. Uh, and uh, and it, it, uh, it was it was you know it was something that was clear. People really wanted to be there, and they wanted to listen. That was another thing. It's not just declarative. All the people saying what this is what it's got to be. It was people saying what are these are some of the possibilities, and I, I agree with you. What we found is that there was a community a huge community of people, uh, uh, birds of a feather, we're not in there by ourselves. And uh, that that is really the magic that you brought uh, as, as folks that we never would have met otherwise, that uh, had something to say and different perspectives. And that mm. uh, spirit of what happened carried on with the other conferences. And I mean, there are 12 events you talked about, you mentioned earlier, that you did, uh, and you mentioned the the We Three one about the Web uh, three point oh, and uh, um, you also did a one on music. Now tell us yes. about that. What was the inspiration for doing one on music? You know, I, I, the quote from Simon Sinek: "People don't buy products and services; they buy culture." Mm -hmm. And when I think about what we build today, I realize that culture and art. You know, I, I said a long time ago that you can have art without technology, but you cannot have technology without art. Mm -hmm. And it's so central to me to make sure that we have liberal arts, which is a form of expression. It's a great form of expression. And it has played a significant role in what we have and use today, actually. Um, and so for me, music was so important to understand how and really as a case study to be candid is how our industry is going to be impacted with this onboarding of technology and i wanted to go with the music industry because they have been greatly affected when it came to the advent launch of web 2 if you will mm -hmm. you know and you know we're no longer using i mean some of us may use vinyl you know for our enjoyment but real, real <laughs> cd players and things like that, you know, they're almost a thing of the past, you know, stream is certainly leading the way. And it's been, it's the music industry has been one of the greatest disrupted industries within the past 30 years and really the past 10 and 20 years. And so it was a good case study to see and to hear from those that have been in this space. What does the world of music look like today with emerging technologies that have arrived and what changes have we seen that have happened and have progressed but with the caveat of great consideration to make sure that we don't forget about our artists because we need to support our artistic community and i stand firm in that in the face of this new world that we find ourselves in with regenerative ai and it comes to art i said mm -hmm. maybe seven years ago and i meant what i said and it's documented it's very clear on it that 
there will be one day when you'll be able to load a whole entire entire novel into a machine learning uh, system and it will be able to translate visually and to be able to pick visually this whole story narrative with characters and mobilization full animation and if you and if you consider the magnitude of let's say take a game of thrones episode where it may take them about four to six months just to create a dragon figure that's in an episode but if you have an ai model that can be able to create that in a little bit of a half a day that's going to disrupt not hundreds but literally thousands of people that work at these companies that for their whole lives if you will their whole career has been about creating animation right and so when we think about what we're seeing with the great disruption of ai when it comes to visualization the great disruption of ai when it comes to information and i would submit and i said this just last week at uh, an event that had over twenty thousand people in, and i haven't even shared all the results of that with ime west when i talk about medical technology i post to Mm -hmm. the audience what happens tom when the technology becomes more advanced than a technologist in other words um the, the, the great disruption of artificial intelligence that we're looking at today and what we are interacting with such as platforms chat gpt midjourney dolly everything that we're interacting with today is nothing compared to what they're already dealing with um in laboratory and you know that better than most tom when it mm -hmm. comes to what's happening in r d versus what's in market and I have a real concern now, and I was quoted just a few weeks ago saying that we knew that this time would come, we just didn't know that it would arrive this soon. And so now that it's here, it's a market, and now it's revealed that it's forced other, others that are building artificial intelligence and have been for so time, because if anybody asks me what's the greatest investment, the singular investment that I've seen happen in Sand Hill Road when it comes to venture capital here in the Valley in the past 10 years, 20 years, hands down, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's been artificial intelligence. And so this has now forced other platforms to reveal their hands. And I had just said the day before, Google suffered from a $100 billion loss in the market in presenting their version of, or a competitor to ChatGPT, if you will, that not only is it gonna force the hands of others to be able to reveal what they have, it is going to dramatically change the way that we look at work, how we work and function. And so that's happening today as why you and I yet speak. And so, but what happens to all of these people that have lost their jobs and they have no other place to land? And I'm seeing that right now. And it's very severely disruptive. And it's a game change, Tom. It is a game change, especially knowing that for those that have lost their jobs, that these jobs can be picked up elsewhere in the world because we work on a hybrid nation and a hybrid sense. And some mm -hmm. platforms have done quite well with this transition. And so Gatherverse is really thinking about community centralization, support care, and really thinking about what are the next steps for survivability of humanity. And that's a really big deal. I'll say this and be done with it for the moment. I remember talking to a person at Intel Capital about five years ago. And they had expressed to me, and he were in one of the attorneys were there. He said, "You know, Chris, the biggest thing that gives me pause about what we're investing in at Intel Capital because they were they were operating uh, at some point with a project for there may be some that remember something called Project Alloy, and Intel had invested millions into vir virtual reality, and then all of a sudden stopped, did a pivot, and really started applying deal flow capital investments in the artificial intelligence." And he expressed to me, he says, the thing that gives me pause about what we're seeing in our R&D is that when it comes to market, there's no question of whether or not it will disrupt people's jobs. It will. But what will happen to the millions of people that will be displaced that have nothing else to go back to? You know, and I thought about that, and he was all business when he said it. And lo and behold, we're starting to see trends of this happening now. And so it gives a great concern. And so I think there has to be some type of stewardship, some type of social responsibility for what we build today and keep that at the forefront. And so what we're building is going at such a rapid clip that our legislators and that our policy people, they do not know how to litigate this in the courts. They do not know how to safeguard this. 
and it's a problem and there's something that we have to do to be, make sure that we're keeping aware and so gather versus playing the role of amplifying those that are sounding the alarm that are helping lead the way that are drawing attention and awareness and really helping make change so that's a so signature and i i i i i will say this is that i know oftentimes things don't seem like it's a big deal until it comes knocking on our front door then it becomes a big deal and right now i mean in the world to understand that this is a big deal yeah thanks for that i i was glad that uh, you brought that up because if you hadn't i was going to, to uh, suggest uh, to get your comments on especially on your ai uh, activity and event so chris you know what we're trying to discuss today is this intersection of technology and um and humanity and uh, here we see our technology taking a dominant role. Used to, we considered uh, our technology as tools, right? Tools that would help us um, uh, be able to do our jobs better, more efficiently, uh, more effectively, uh, be able to enjoy doing our jobs, perhaps. And now we see, um, especially with the, I felt that we were at a, a pivot point where we were going from being tool makers to actually content generators, uh, because the the mm. let's face it, the medium is there. It yeah, it it could it could be improved, but the medium is there, and now it's turning to the message, and the message of the classical producers of content and music and storytelling and things like that. We're now beginning to question that. Well, actually, technology is encroaching on that, because with um, uh, chat GPT and uh, regenerative art type stuff. Good grief! Where are the artists going to be now? Yes. And this was—I yes. uh, felt, gosh, for once they are going to get the chance to lead the charge. I mean, it's just like what happened with television. That mm. after television really became a commodity, and it—you uh, know—and it—it really now is all about what what is the message that goes in the medium. So, back to the the issue. Here we've had this huge disruption, and this is the singularity has been talked about for many years. We're, mm -hmm. we're actually seeing the beginnings of that uh, disruption of the fabric of uh, not only what's going on with our technology, but with society as a whole. And, uh, and not only are we adding uh, these new people into the being unemployed, they join all the others, all the idle hands that are out there on the earth who have uh, have just as they're just as intelligent as anybody else, but they haven't had opportunity. Now, what does this mean when we now are able to take this technology and give opportunity, but then, about, what about all the others that are now have lost their jobs in mid-career? What are they going to do? What do you see as the um, a let's put it bright outcome? out of all of this? What is the pathway to the bright outcome? You mentioned that we need to do this uh, somewhat husbanding of what's going on with our technology, and that's control. That's controlling something, this beast. Uh, right. is, that, right. is that the solution? We have to control the beast, or somehow do we harness it in order to raise our civilization to another level that we not had before? I think that's an apropos and remarkable question, Tom, and you bring us to the third phase in the scope of what we're looking at. And for the audience sitting here, all of this is unscripted. So everything that's being said, it's not like Tom and I huddled together and said, hey, let's go and address this and say this and that. That's just what that's not. And what's so apropos about what you said is, do we make an attempt to stop what's being built in terms of um, the potential risk of technological advancement? Or do we embrace it and say, let's move forward? I say we embrace it and move forward, and here's why. The idea is, is that once, because it's going to happen whether we like it or not, I think the idea is, is that we embrace it, but at the self-same time, I know that when things like this happen through great disruption, because this happened circa uh, 2007, uh, Q3 when mm -hmm. the iPhone came out, I remember specifically and very indistinctly in 2008, if you will, that it was the beginning of the Great Recession. And we saw in, in, in the heightened growth of the Great Recession, if you will, what we saw was innovation shine through. 
and let's put a, let's look at this word innovation. Innovation shined through to where there were people that were scrambling for cocoa developers here around Silicon that were looking for people that could build in PHP and that could build and help build the thing that Stephen Jobs called and introduced to the iOS ecosystem as applications. The applications weren't the first time that we've heard it from Steve Jobs, but in this fashion, in this capacity, we had never seen applications used like this and readily adopted and available. And so what happened was, is why all these people were getting laid off and fired because of, in a lot of ways, bad fiduciary responsibility from Fortune 50, Fortune 500 heads. There was an article that came out in the New York Times that said, you know what? A group of people got together, they stood around the table, and they no longer found confidence in attempting to go back into the theater of the private sector. And so they stood around the table, and a woman said, hey, you, how much do you have? And the guy says, I've got five bucks. And she says, how much do you have over there? And Jenny says, you know, I've got 10 bucks. Peter, how about you? 50 cents. Troy, how about you? I've got a dollar. Lamont, what do you got? I got $100. And so they all put it on the table, and they built a startup. They innovated. They found a way forward because once disruption happens, good technology is superseded by great technology, and great technology is superseded by even better technology. That's what we commonly refer to as the disrupt. However, we have never seen something as disruptive to contemporary our time which is a technology, and it's called COVID-19, the pandemic. Mm. It has been incredibly disruptive to how we operate, function, and abide within society. With that said, we've been able to navigate the waters in a lot of ways due to technologies that were readily available. Zoom didn't just pop up March 2020. Um, Blue Jeans, Hangouts, WebEx, they all did just pop up in 2020. They were here but they went with an increase going from 10 million active users to 400 million active users. But this is where I'm getting at. When we talk about the next step, and I would say through the eyes and the lens of my eyes into Gatherverse, we've really wanted to speak, we've been talking about of late in this past year about creating a sustainable financial model for heart-powered startups and organizations and really doing this through a funding trio of venture angel and crowd because here's what i believe i believe that there are great platforms that exist that have the capability to success in going successfully going through lab to funding lab to market initiatives but the one thing they don't enjoy is the thing that they need the most is capital and venture and for what they're building we must now find a way and take a candid look and have an open discussion on how do we bridge the gap between those that are building with barely anything that they have in bootstrap position, organizations, not just startups that are building product, but whole entire organizations that are geared towards making sure we're safeguarding what we're building today. How do we get deal flow and venture capital and money to them? How do we get more resources, financial resources, to incredible educational platforms that can serve hundreds of thousands of people at a time without them having to leave their living rooms? How do we drive venture capital to them in a safe and responsible way without our investors for angels and VCs taking on significant risk and making sure that there's safeguard practices in place to where it turns into a more key turn and more situational awareness of saying that this is something we must do right now is innovate to be able to give to the market, to be able to create a new structured society. That is a very big deal. Now, I say that. I say that in saying that right now, today's circus to be able to get any type of capital, whether it's from private sector and public sector, is ridiculous. It just is. And even I know investors that realize this is ridiculous to have to go through the song and dance and to put on this American Idol performance to get some revenue and to get some <laughs> capital just to be able to raise, to just be able to have a startup sustain. Because if we don't innovate, if we do not innovate, then what does that leave us with? It leaves us with absence, and it leaves us being pariahs, if you will, on dependent on public sector dollars. And I don't think that that's necessary because governments, as big and as bulky as they are, they don't enjoy all the necessary capital to be able to sustain society because of inflation. Have you seen the cost of an egg and an avocado today? 
So when we think about it, when we think about it and where we're at right now, we must say the thing that we need to press towards when it comes to business, contemporary to our time, is finding a financial model that works for organizations and for startups that are heart powered. And I don't take mm-hmm. away from our entertainment communities. We really care for our entertainment communities and other platforms that are building amazing things. However, I say that in the face of, I have seen more waste in Silicon Valley and around the world with platforms that have, haven't served the benefit of a rock in the garden, they haven't grown, they have been getting millions, and some even billions, and we can name names, a lot of revenue, a lot of capital, and they haven't succeeded. They were caught in the peak of inflated interest when it came to the investment and found themselves in the trough of disillusionment. Now, we know from the failed data of the trough, we have the peak of the slope of enlightenment and, peak, uh, and, and, and the plateau of creativity. I get that. I understand that. However, what we're looking at today is a necessity. And this is the thing that I picked up from Gatherverse and these voices from so many speakers listening to every single speaker that has now been part of Gatherverse is that they're building, they're building from their hearts. And the one thing that holds them back is the inability to move forward because they lack the fuel and the capability and the wherewithal to be able to get survivable resources to continue the journey forward. And I just don't want to be the person that does not do anything about those that go so deep in the forest. And I mean deep in the forest. When we entered that forest, there was a pathway. It was already set for us. But when we entered that forest, we got so deep along the way amongst the branches and the brambles that we went off the path and we realized that we have to be the ones to create the path forward. And when we do that, to leave a little light on for the ones that come behind us. And in order to do that, if we don't give them the necessary equipment and gear to be able to do this, they will be stuck in the middle of the forest with no way to go and no light to move forward. And I just believe that now is the time for platforms such as Meta, such as Vibe, the ones that we care for, engage the platforms that can afford it to even on a monocle level is to really start to think about social responsibility in a new way beyond a fringe. This is for good VR or this is for good technology and really thinking about social sustainability because if we don't have this at some point, it will impact their profit margins because no one will be able to afford any type of gear that you have to market because we'll start to have to realize that it comes down to us living when it comes to food in our belly, roof over the head, clothes on the back of our children and ourselves, and we won't be able to afford to buy the things that we enjoy today. Wow, Chris. That's profound. So, in the end, what really differentiates us? What makes, why do the humans need to be around then if the machines can do, uh, can, can eventually take care of all of the things that have to happen uh, to keep the earth safe and functioning? What are we here for? What do you see is really the essence of humanity? as we go into the next hundred years. What do we bring to the table? Assuming we have uh, these, um, we're dealing with these issues um, and that we are providing, let me, let me just, let me just go off to uh, on a tangent a minute. <laughs> I remember this, Please. we've talked about this, Chris, you and I've talked about this. There was a, an episode in one of the Star Trek movies, right? I, I love Star Trek, but especially because of its, <laughs> its, um, its positive look into the future, the far future. And, um, and so uh, one of this, this is one of the, the movies, one of the, the films, feature films, Star Trek, uh, with Captain Picard in it. And uh, it's when they first went back in time, that's when a Borg appeared, when they went back in time <laughs> uh, to uh, visit with Ephraim Cochran when they were developing the warp drive. Right. 
And uh, so what was happening is that they needed to go back to see when that happened. And they went back in time and the prime directive told them, you can't interfere with society. Daniel is waving his hand saying, I can't, our time is running out. Um, I'm very politely saying that um, we're hugely enjoying your words and conversations. Okay. And I think I'm pretty sure we're going to have some uh, very interesting questions. So if we could make this section another two or three minutes and wrap it up and get some questions, okay. that would be fantastic. Is that okay? okay? Well, let me just, yes, thanks. Sure. Thanks. Sure. I, keep, you're okay. keeping me from waxing poetic here, but uh, the, uh, the bottom <laughs> I love line. Your poetry. Yeah, I, 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 the bottom line was uh, Whoopi Goldberg gets beamed up onto the, the, the bridge of the, of the Starship Enterprise. And here you have the prime directive had been violated. And then when uh, uh, she, she uh, you know, Picard is, of course, saying, you know, oh, gosh, what have we done here? And then he said, oh, what the heck? She's here. Well, I might as well show her around. And of course, she's a scientist and engineer, too. And so he's showing her around the starship, and she said, oh, gosh, this is incredible. Well, who paid for all of this? And Picard said, what do you mean, who paid for it? She said, well, I mean, where did all the money come from to make this? And he said, I really don't understand your question. And she said, well, and then he thought, oh, he says, there is no money. There is no money. Yeah. Everyone, everyone does all that they can do in contributing together in order to build these uh, devices that help us explore the universe. Now, uh, if we had now this confluence of machines that are able to do their best and humans that were not constrained by the, the reasons that you gave, what would happen as we go forth together in the future? Well, one, <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that example, and and I do remember this uh, this story happening in Roddenberry's world. And since we're talking about Star Trek, you know, the boldly glow where no man has gone before, or woman, if you will. And for me, this really is an important question of what do we do next, and we only have a little bit of time in this life that we're given. We're, th there's only a little bit of time left that we have in this world from the day that we set foot in here. And our contribution, you know, I think about Whitman, you know, Walt Whitman, that the powerful play exists and you may contribute a verse in Dead Poet Society. What mm -hmm. will your verse be? Right. And we know, you know, thinking about the world's a stage and we have our entrances and our exits. And when I think about the time that's given for what we have in this life, for what we can build, it's so finite in its scope and its measure. You know, I was thinking the other day um, in consideration of time itself, and was considering of late that when someone gives me even a single moment of their time, it's a thing they'll never get back. And it's, it's as if we've all arrived, it's just we've, upon emerging from our mother's womb, and we're each given a jar. This jar is crafted a delicate glass, let's say with a deep brown wooden top. Contained within this jar is time. It's finite in its measure. Now, Tom, each passing moment, a little is taken until one day, one moment, the glass is fully transparent. All the way around, floor to ceiling. And so considering that the gift of one's time, though it may seem small in the moment, is truly one of the most precious things one can give. And consider, it's an act of generosity. It's the reflection of the giver's trust and mutual regard for the receiver. So in this world where time is a limited resource, it may be one of the most precious things one can give. And if the machines do take over, if you will, they'll never supersede the hearts and minds of mankind, and we would be heading into the next given state of grace, if you will. The next moment from my heart is to be benevolent to one another, and I am very spiritual. And for me, it's about understanding the things of the Creator and that what He has built and placed in this existence. And I know that everyone will probably have a different interpretation and understanding of why they're here, 
where they come from and where they're going. But the hope is while we share this planet together, that there's human generosity and benevolence one to another. To me, that supersedes technology as we know it. It really starts to deal with the chasms in the heart. Wow. Thank you, Chris. That's, thank you. This is the most uh, thrilling, I think the most thrilling interview I've, I've ever had <laughs> and inter interaction with oh. another human being. This is really wonderful. So, uh, uh, Daniel. I think a lot of us feel the same way, Tom. Would you say, guys, have you enjoyed this conversation? Absolutely riveting. Chris, you have a perspective like few I know on this. And of course, sharing that with Tom is amazing in this, uh, in this beautiful setting. Um, Tom, any well, final last word before I start opening up for questions? Well, I do want to say that um, yeah. we certainly want to put up the slide again of the, of the Gatherverse yes, Summit absolutely. that is coming up next week. And uh, Chris, you want you want? Is there anything you want to say about that, Chris? Yeah, I hope that everybody will take time to attend. And and um, I realize now that oh, years gone by, and I used to think that it was about how many people attend. But I'm really appreciating about who attends and how many people are expressing and speaking. And I believe that for those that either have never been or have have attended. Uh, we know that you can't spend the whole three days with us because you have your given commitments, which is reasonable. But I hope that you would spend some time with us and seek and find community within uh, the Gatherverse ecosystem and with our friends here at Virtual World Society and elsewhere. And there's a special day, too, that we're happening with Virtual World Society helping open up. And I hope that you'll mm -hmm. be able to join us at, at least for that and spend a little time and, and, and share um, the time that is finite <laughs> with us. And, and, and we welcome you and we praise the global world and and and, and this, is, this is a great time to be together mm -hmm. yeah it is indeed wonderful so, yeah looking forward to gatherverse next week yeah. yeah and then too just a reminder we do have a fireside chat every month and uh the next one is on going to be on march the 30th uh where we'll be uh, uh interacting with marcus shingles marcus is also a board member along mm -hmm. with chris of the virtual world society and is uh, orchestrating a wonderful program having to do with the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, the competition uh, having to do with the metaverse and how it can impact that. And we'll be hearing from him. And then also uh, we have our podcasts um, that uh, are, are taking place um, regularly. Be sure to check in those podcasts. Chris, you've had, uh, you've had the opportunity to uh, participate in the podcast also in the past and, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and others. Um, so be sure to look that up too. And so yeah, if you're not podcast, a member. Mm -hmm. And we got yeah. also the newsletter coming out soon again. Newsletter coming Keep up. Look and, out for that. and be sure uh, those of you who are not members of the Virtual World Society, please sign up, go to our website, virtualworldsociety.org and uh, become a member. Uh, it's free. And then you have access to all of these wonderful things. So thanks again, Chris, Absolutely. for this uh, time we've had together. And thanks, uh, Daniel and Laurel, for the arrangements um, made here today. We look forward to as this venue changes and upgrades. So now let's just turn it over to, and, and thanks for everyone coming. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, for this is a, and we got a historical some Q &A. event. And let's do the Q&A. <laughs> Fantastic. So what we're going to do, um, just so that the rules of engagement are clear, we have a little bit of time, and we do want to get through a few questions. Hopefully you've been thinking about something you want to ask or contribute. So please make your contribution or question short and concise. And then both of you also, I know what it's like answering a question. Um, if we can keep them uh, relatively short so we can have maybe three or four good questions, that would be ideal. So um, you can either raise your hand if you're on a Mac, you can shake your, uh, uh, or nod your head um if you have anything you want yeah we've got steph over here all right steph please unmute yourself and i'm gonna find you um uh there you go uh, am i unmuted okay steph you should yeah. be on mic steph here with the gray and red what's your what's your question please well my question um is that we it's wonderful to be able to see in the distance where we may be heading and what we might have to do in order to get there 
But what's the first step? What's the baby step? We're, we're, at, we're just coming out of the cradle now. And what do you think is that one first next step that we can, we can head toward? Okay. In a few words, what's the next short, immediate step to take? Tom, you want to go for it? <laughs> well, I, I uh, no. <laughs> I have an idea, but I, I want to defer to you, uh, Chris, on this. Sure. One. I'll keep it short and brief, and thank you for giving your question. And to me, we're living the first step. This is the first step. The first step is discussion, dialogue, and then moving towards impact. I think the second step towards after the first step is um, community centralization, human centricity, and then going towards that third of what we're looking at is how do we fund these narratives that have gone through refinement mm -hmm. and expression through the community? How do we fund these narratives so we go forward? Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. And I appreciate both the succinct question and the concise answer. Just what I was hoping for. Uh, wonderful. We have another person here. Alex, I think you're good to go. Thank you. All Steve. right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, just a quick question regarding uh, educational integration. I mean, I see universities doing a great job um, in the K through 12 space, uh, workforce development and career and tech ed. Um, it's really hard to kind of bridge that gap and really get in there. What, what do you see are, are some of the, the approaches or, or strategies that are helpful uh, to really initiate proof of concepts and get people to uh, allow a bit more experimentation at that level? You know, I think right. that's a really great question because when, mm -hmm. well, well, for one, when we look at what's happening with education, morphologically, we see a great change happening. You know, there's just this, there's this commentary that came out days ago that there's so many students who aren't going back to school <clears throat> since um, 2020, if you will, and they're not going back to school. They don't want to learn the way the traditional ways that we've learned. And I believe that we have an open slate opportunity to refine the very way. Uh, not just in North America, but elsewhere around the world, uh, transcontinental, and how we go about learning uh, how to um, implement new forms of education to accelerate communication and to accelerate and to adopt what the curricula is being addressed and what it's good for the time now present. And there are those who, and especially you got Dr. Morris that's sitting here, that have invested their lives in this very type of work and what they're doing in their careers. And so I would suggest speaking with those such as her and at the self same time, I realized that there is such a huge barrier to entry when it comes to public sector and the machine is so slow. We need to find a way to be able to enhance uh, the tempo and to be able to create a conducive cadence that is appropriate for how education needs to move instead of how it's been moving, even subsequently yeah. before the pandemic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, the other thing I would add is educators unite. Those of you who are pioneering prototypes left, right, and center, find yourselves together. Communities like uh, Virtual Society, Educators and VR, and others. Um, are bringing people together to share knowledge, to share projects and solutions, but there's still a long way to go, Alex. It's a, it's a, a friction riddled path, but all the more enjoyable, I would argue. Okay. I think we let, have, let me, let me, let me, I have to throw one quick caveat to that because I absolutely Please. agree. And I'm sitting here and, I'm, and forgive me, Laurel, with all the work that you lead when it comes to educators and VR. This, this is the thing. There's enough case study that's on the table. Right now, we need to move past the case studies because there are organizations and people that have lived it, rendered it out, and it has to, again, move to funding these ideas for trial and error to find out what are the best ways forward. We've had enough dialogue, and now is the time for actionable and sustainable impact. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, we've got one over there in a minute by Saul Michael first. So I'm going to come to Michael, and then we're going to close out with um, another good friend, Brian, over here. So, um, Lance, if you can help Michael, you're, you're good to go, Michael. Hi. Uh, hi, hi, folks. Um, I have a question. I'm Michael Avis from Toronto, Canada. And you're talking about humanity and community. How do we really 
encourage people from disadvantaged communities to get into the space. I've been to a lot of events and I often often see very similar demographics in these in these spaces. So how do we how do we yeah. do that work? Sure. So one of the things about Gatherverse, and I think that's a really important question. Thanks for asking. At our first event that Tom has made mention of, and so have I today, one of the questions I was repeatedly asked and have been asked throughout the years, how, how did your events become so diverse? And I hadn't realized that we had such a, such a, you know, heavy attendance of women and people of community of color. And I said, you know, I, I said, that was a really good question. And it really just dawned on me that we have to live this. You know, it's one thing to be able to study and implement diversity, equity, inclusion, and social belonging. But it's a whole nother thing just to live in. So I believe that you draw what you attract by what you manifest. And so to get further into those communities that are really unseen and unheard, it goes back to what I said initially is that we have to create a beacon so bright that they are inspired and drawn to us. And so the hard part of gather version, the obstacle is that all of our events are free. I have completely removed the barrier to innovation to having to pay to get good information. It's all free. Mm. And so a lot of it is a labor of, of, of care. And so mm. if we had better allies to be able to help us give deal flow for extending our market presence and voice, I believe that we can do and create more impact on top of what we've already done. So your question is, is well met and, and we're, we're hoping that, you know, we're, we're, we're afforded the opportunity to extend. And I would also elaborate just briefly on that. So building a bright beacon is excellent, right? The moth to the flame, it attracts people. But I would argue that you also have to actually grab your stuff and go and find the underserved communities, actually make your way to them so, and take your equipment and with the solutions. Some of the really poor people I am learning through some of the amazing work that our colleagues at Virtual World Society are doing, where we're funding families who would otherwise never see this equipment. We're funding them, we're taking the equipment there, we're helping them set up accounts, uh, commission their devices. If we need to get them data, we'll try and get them connected to data. That's the other end of that spectrum. So a bright beacon is one end of that spectrum where you have to attract people. But on the other hand, you actually physically, digitally have to lift people up into the realm where they can. If people don't have data, even on Zoom, they can't join. So that's the other end, the other extreme end of the spectrum. I agree. Right. But I do agree with that. I think I will yeah. add to that. I agree with that. And, you know, we talk about a gatherverse. How do we say that the met, how can we claim that the metaverse is fully arrived when most people don't even have common access to Wi-Fi and broadband? Right. So oh, water, we have to clean really water. <laughs> clean water. So what we have to do is what we have to do is get to a, a narrative of reality that's grounded in reality, manage our expectations. And I absolutely wholeheartedly agree, Daniel. We have to bring yeah. this to them, but but we can't. Yeah. But if we're going to bring something to somebody, it has to be supplied somehow. So we need capital to be able to even do that. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. That 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 journey, that work, um, involves a lot of trust building. It's, it's a whole conversation, and maybe we should have Angelina come and join us here again and share some of the work, should, the 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 findings for right. our research, because I think at mm -hmm. some point that's very much a conversation to be had. Uh, By the way, for those, those, are, those are real quick. Those that are listening, these are the kind of fun things we we go back and forth on in virtual societies. So come join the country. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. Exactly. <laughs> there's, the, there's the other thing. There's the other thing too. Before we go to the last question, that Please. Chris brought up, I think the uh, we, we all of us think that um, we're just a little fish in a big pond, and we cannot uh, really do much by ourselves. But you know. I think the whole object is not necessarily to have to go after catching those big fish all the time. I think mm. it's having a lot of little fish, a mm. lot of little fish. And that's what, that's what the gatherverse is in a way. I mean, mm. it's, it's, mm. it, it's a, yeah, it's some more a, a movement. And what happens is whatever, just like that the startup uh, illustration you gave, Chris, we take what mm. we have and we get right. outside of ourselves and start thinking about you know, how do we transcend the limitations we have in our, in, in, in the right. things we've discussed right. today? And that is right. to take what we have and to right. put 
put it into the pot with all the other people who feel the same right. way we do as we see in the Gettiverse. And then that right. becomes this mechanism that Chris talked about that helps right. fund these new ideas. And then those new ideas can come from anyone and especially right. lifting humanity, what we're trying yeah. to, to do collectively, I believe. So right. uh, it, it, wow. you don't have to be rich in order to get something done, is what I'm trying right. to say, I guess. Well, Matt, you're here. All right. Thank you for that. I hear the passion in your voice as always, Tom. I love it. <laughs> All right. We got Brian from Burkassel. Hi. So hey, Brian. I don't have much... As, so much of a question as I do, uh, I'd like to refer back to uh, Steph's uh, question, uh, what, what would you now? And I think the last little while here, what Tom said, Daniel and Chris, uh, kind of refer to what I believe we need to do next, and that is we need to all be involved with each other uh, and come to understand what this technology can do, will do, and be, be competent in ourselves and in our understanding so that we can describe this this incredible technology to others because there's a pain point from going from the real world to virtual world people look at it as a gaming system or whatever else but for us to learn what this technology can do and the amazing you know uh, personal connections you can make here and how quite frankly it you can create memories and experiences here in virtual reality that as i look back in the years of, of my experience in virtual reality i don't remember whether those experiences were real world or virtual world those were experiences with with, mm -hmm. with emotion with learning with connection and everything else and i think the next point or the thing that we need to do in the most now along um, along with everything else we've talked about is be evangelists and the best way to do that is yeah. understand this this technology well enough to describe it to others and to be able to encourage others to come and experience it for themselves the more people spend time in these environments the more they understand the power that virtual reality has and i would say that yeah, is well one said. of the biggest things we need to do mm -hmm. right now well thank said. you well said here here here, here. Well, um, I have hugely enjoyed this, Christopher, Tom, and the audience, and thanks again to Educators in VR. We are a little bit over. We always are a little bit over because the conversations get so um, deep and meaningful, exactly my kind of conversations. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and inaugurating our provisional space uh, and home in engage uh, with the for the virtual world society um don't know how soon we'll get a custom space up and running um but this is good enough for now i was thinking it was nice and homely we got a rug we got it a fire is. um mm -hmm. you know you can get comfy here so thank you for coming uh take some inspiration from this conversation and this in this meeting of, of like-minded people take those seeds and and take them out into your interactions let's make the metaverse a place where everybody feels safe included welcome inspired and um you know motivated to to, to do good together let's build better worlds together here in the metaverse thank you so much chris Thank you so much, Tom. You, what we're going to do bet. now, um, feel free to stay on a little bit. The event proper is over, and I'm going to ask Matt, if you can hear me, the cameraman, um, uh, if you can close down now. We're going to